Hello and welcome to the Bellevue Literary Reviews Book Talk. My name is Perry Klass. I'm a pediatrician. I'm on the board of the Bellevue Literary Review. And for our first book talk, we are really delighted to have with us Delia Efron, who is a novelist, essayist, and screenwriter, and to be here to talk about her wonderful new book, Left on Tenth. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. Welcome, Delia. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I loved your book. Um, <laughs> I'm Thank hoping you. you'll begin by talking a little bit about the book and how you came to write it and how we get to where we are with it today. Well, I live on 10th Street in Greenwich Village, so left on 10th is my way home. Um, about four, I guess this is this story is four years of my life in which just about everything big that could happen to me did happen to me. I lost my husband of 32 years. My internet crashed. I fell in love again. I then, in the midst of this amazing love affair at 71, I should say, I was 71 years old, I then got AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. And this is a story of love and medicine and friendship and so much luck that it makes you wonder about things like miracles. And I wrote it because, well, of course I'm a writer. So if life gives you that story, you have to tell it. But uh, I, the cure for AML was so extreme because I ended up having a bone marrow uh, stem cell transplant. And um, I really didn't think I was ever right again. I mean, it is extremely traumatic to go through an experience like that. And I kept saying to my friends, you know, I'm not, I, I don't think so. I think my writing's over. But after a while, my writing heart started beating. And I just thought, I have to write this. And if I do write it, I didn't know this when I did it, but I think somewhere subconsciously I did know this. It got me on the other side of the trauma because I had been through what three years of, of, of extreme medical trauma and it stays with you. It haunts your dreams, it, you know, everything. And then I made this thing out of it. And so I, I have to say, if you go through a medical trauma as I did, if you can knit it, dance it, draw it, paint it, something it, write it, it will help you get through it. And even before we get to the medical trauma in the book. The book begins with the death of your husband and with you writing about, um, talk a little bit about that first essay that you, you quote in the book about um, Verizon. Oh, well, I, my, after my husband died uh, and it was about, it was about six months later and I was just, it's such a lonely time that, that time, I mean, when you lose someone that, just every place you look in your house, there they are, only they're not there. And um, so about six or seven months in, I thought, okay, I'm gonna shut down his landline, which was the only thing I had even tried to do. And I got into a huge problem with Verizon because they shut down, they shut down my internet. I can't even explain it. It's so complicated, but I had two landlines. And when I shut down one, they shut down the internet on the other landline. Well, uh, it turns out, by the way, millions of people have a problem with their phone companies when they try to shut down, shut down their landlines because I got so much mail because I wrote a piece about it. I was in a total rage. I was on the phone with them for hours every day dealing with their prompts, getting disconnected. I went into such a rage that I just, that's what I do, I wrote it. And I wrote this very funny piece called Love and Hate on Hold with Verizon and the New York Times published it. And about four months later, well, I got a lot of mail. I just wanna say, I, I did get a lot of mail and um, I got a lot of comments, but the mail came in like through my website and uh, I hadn't realized it was kind of a bird call 
because I started to get strange notes from men saying, well, if you're ever in Hartford, give me a call, you know, like things like that, you know, but then one day, it was three days after the year anniversary of, of Jerry's death, I got an email from a psychiatrist, a Jungian analyst living in the Bay Area. And, you know, he said we'd had three dates 54 years before, all right, um, when I was in college. Not just before I was in college, actually. I was 18 years old. And that my sister Nora had fixed us up. And, and there was so much synchronicity and strangeness about this. I mean, the last trip he had taken with his late wife had been to Syracuse, which is a falling down place in Sicily where my last book is based. It's called Syracuse. And um, he knew Nora, obviously, from when he was younger. Um, he was a Jungian analyst. And I had been invited to a Jungian conference to speak three months earlier and had said to myself, what's a Jungian? I, I better meet one to find out, you know, and there suddenly was a Jungian in my inbox, right? So um, I, it was a, the loveliest note. So I wrote him back. Oh, and then I looked him up because, you know, you always Google someone. That's the first thing you have to do to make sure they don't have a record or something. And um, it turned out he was an expert in sexual harassment and he'd written two books on it. So he was just obviously a great feminist, which I like to think of myself as being one too. And I just couldn't quite believe it. But anyway, I wrote him back and we fell into this amazing love affair. First we were to commute, I, I was in New York in my little apartment in Greenwich Village and he was in uh, Marin County, just north of San Francisco. And we started to email and it just exploded. And it, it was actually the last thing I ever expected to have happened to me. I, I don't even know how it did. But anyway, all this is in the book, all this, all the letters between us and the notes. It's, 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 I think it, I was, when I was writing the book and I was reading them, I just, I kind of couldn't believe them. They were so, you know, real and moving. And so anyway, they're all in there, but, and then four months later, I went to the doctor. Now, this is an important part of the story, which is that I was being trapped for a for leukemia because my sister Nora had died. She had myelodysplastic syndrome, which almost inevitably morphs into leukemia. And then it did with her. And I was being trapped because we were a bone general match and they were worried about me. And I had one thing off in my CBC count, but, um, but this had been going on for six or seven years. It was in every six months I go to see Dr. Robos at Wild Cornell and she would say, you're a boring blood, go away, you know. And um, four months later, I went into the doctor and boom, I had leukemia. So, um, you know, everything changes on a day like that, just everything. And uh, I called up Peter and he flew in that night and he barely didn't leave my side again, really. Um, so the book is all about the story from the m moment Jerry, my late husband, died through all this love story and meeting Peter and then and then the medicine. And, and all the way through the book, it's a story about friendship because I had these women warriors. That's why I think of my good girlfriends. And I was just carried by Peter and my women friends through this experience. So it's a book about friendship as well as everything else. It's, and as you say, it's a book which weaves in the emails that you get, um, some of the things that you write, the messages you get. And one of the things which makes it both so personal and also so moving, I think, is, is some of that, the little pieces of collage that you put into it together with your, your own voice as a writer telling the story. Um, oh, thank you. I, I you know, I fortunately have friends write absolutely amazing emails and it's, a, it's a, and, and you know what else, when you get sick, you don't remember things. You really don't remember that 
I mean, I was in the, when I ultimately had a bone marrow stem cell transplant, um, I was in the ICU for a certain period of time. I have no memory of it. I still don't know. I've, in my head, I have never seen an ICU. So Meredith, who was with me then, you know, she told me all about it and wrote me all about it. So I have, and, and two of my best friends, one's in LA and one's in Wales. And Julia is writing me from Wales about what I'm going through before she comes to see me. And they just make the book, I think, richer for all the different voices experiencing my helping me and and also things about their lives, which is kind of great. Um, one of the things which is moving in the book is the way you talk about the gratitude, the affection, what comes through for the people who get you through, including you mentioned Dr. Robos, um, who's a very important character in the book. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor and I was reading about her and thinking, I want to be her when I grow up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She's very gifted. <laughs> I bet you are too. <laughs> um, but I wondered if maybe there was um, something in the book that I've never seen before, I don't think, in a, a narrative about someone's illness. Uh, could, would, would you tell us the story of writing about the drug and about being involved with the drug and the reaction you got to it? Well, when I was first diagnosed, Dr. Robo said there's a new drug in that's in trials called CPX351. And it's almost done with this trial, and I think that it is perfect for you, and I think it can put you in remission. The thing about Dr. Robos is that she is really positive. And I began to believe as I was sick that you want to have positive around you all the time. I mean, the friends I, I took this, that I invited really to take this journey with me are all positive. Peter was always positive with me. And Dr. Robo said this, you know, this is this drug. So I, um, you know, Peter said to me when he met Dr. Robo, he said, we're on the Robo's train. We go wherever she tells us. And so she said, this is the drug. And I then did go into remission from it, which was absolutely thrilling. And, but during that time, because my sister had died of this disease, I did not tell people except very, very close friends that I was sick. And this is not my nature. I My nature is just to let it out. I did not like having dinners with people who didn't know what was really going on in my life. It just wasn't comfortable for me. But I talked it over with Dr. Robos and she said, you know, she didn't want people to think, oh, her sister died, she's dying too. She she wanted, I, I needed to protect my hope. And so I didn't tell about it. And but it became more, but when I went into remission, then I thought, well, maybe I can tell people now from this place. And it just so happened that Dr. Robos, the CPX was in its last stages um, of getting FDA approval. And Dr. Robo said, you know, there isn't for leukemia the kind of patient advocacy that there is for breast cancer or for prostate cancer. She said, so, you know, would you think about writing something? And at that moment, I knew that the way I could tell everyone <laughs> was to write a piece for the New York Times about what had happened to me. So since I had written a lot of romantic comedies, um, I sort of started it out like, you know, I thought I'd fallen into my own romantic comedy and I'd tell about, you know, the loss of Jerry and meeting Peter and and my internet crashing. And then and then what I, what I talked about in this was that no, this wasn't a romantic comedy because I got diagnosed with leukemia. And I, the New York Times took the piece and I sent it to everyone I knew the night before it was published. So I sent it out of my computer. So it was, you know, fine and everything. And I woke up the next morning. And, and by the way, I write personally. So it's one of the things I do. But this was the most personal piece I have ever written. And the next morning I woke up, the phone rings. It's my friend John. He's a doctor, Dr. John LaPook. And he said, did you leave your byline on the piece on purpose? 
And I said, what? And he said, your byline isn't on the piece. Well, I just about fainted. I got up, I was at my brother-in-law's house and I ran downstairs and I looked at the kitchen table and sure enough, there was the printed newspaper and there was my story and no name. I just could not believe it. Now, so it's never happened to me in my life. This is the Sunday review section of the Times. I, I've been published there many times. It had never happened as far as I could see. Everybody who was in that paper always had their byline. I just, it was so creepy. But I, you know, of course I thought it was some sort of test. I mean, you're alive. Be happy about that, you know? Don't, don't fuss about a byline. Um, I wrote my editor immediately. She was mortified, she said. And uh, I mean, it was some, I don't know how it happened. I really don't. Um, but it was in the online, uh, you know, in the online edition, my name was there, thank God, which is what most people read. But it was, it, you know, this whole story in this book has things coming at you that you don't expect. And, and that was just one of the big ones. Um, tell us about the response that you got um, or yeah. read to us. From the response that you got, you know, it was, I mean, there were, aside from the fact of my friends just writing the most wonderful notes to me, um, the response in the paper, it was the number one most emailed for more than one day. I mean, it was just a really, it was big and people still remember it. And um, there were so many comments and they were all, well, 99%, they were, they were absolutely wonderful. And it was transporting. I mean, it was like my feet left the ground. It was just an incredible experience. Um, and someone heard people talking on a Soho street corner about it. And somebody else heard somebody at a restaurant talking about it. I mean, I felt like my happiness, because it was also about falling in love with Peter, it was everywhere, you know? You know, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. And then, of course, I heard also from the people who invented the drug. And do you do you want to read that? Yeah, I got this amazing email. Um, this drug was in, was invented by a Canadian company called Celator, and they had sold it to um, Jazz Pharmaceuticals. And uh, this was a letter from a woman who worked with the team at Celator inventing this drug. And it just randomly arrived and she was darling about letting me put it in the book. From Melody Nelson, Dear Miss Efren, I read your article about your journey with AML and your treatment with CPX 351. I remember the day my colleagues and I sat around a boardroom table in Vancouver wondering if our team could make that drug. It was third on the list of about eight potential drug combinations for different cancers. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears followed over the past 15 years, but we are grateful we're finally nearing the finishing line. I hesitated writing you, but I felt compelled to let you know that the scientists who created and co-developed CPX351, I'm blessed to call them my friends, are amazing and wonderful human beings. Not just brilliant and hardworking, but kind, generous, funny, and compassionate. It's been a drug not created by, quote, big pharma, which unfortunately has the reputation of being cold, callous, and money hungry. It was a drug cultivated carefully by a small, dedicated crew who wanted to help make a difference in the fight against cancer. I cry routinely lately thinking that it's actually happening, but we never hear from patients. There's confidentiality, of course, so we don't know who they are. So your article touched me deeply. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for encouraging the FDA to move this along. We all agree like you that more people will need this. More people will undoubtedly respond like you to CPX351. Thank you for being brave and trusting in our drug during this clinical trial. I wish you many years of a happy, healthy life with your family. With deepest sincerity, Melody. So again, I just want to say that I think that the other letters and voices that you include in this narrative in which I think everyone can 
here listening to you, you're telling the story yourself um, so strongly in your own voice. I was just so moved that you would be acknowledging not just the doctors, the nurse, the physical therapist, but that it actually reaches out to the science since what you end up doing is something that was honestly so high tech. It certainly wasn't around when I was training um, in terms of you know the kind of bone marrow transplant. And it really is um, putting your faith in techniques that are have just been developed or are still being developed or experimental drugs. Um, Dr. Robo said to me that, um, you know, there are there were new drugs in for AML now after years of nothing. That's a quote, you know. And so I just happened to get this illness when things were happening scientifically. And and the bone marrow stem cell transplant I had, which is called a haplocord transplant, was invented recently. It wasn't even available when my sister was sick, which she died in 2012. And uh, that was since I didn't have a match, a haplocord transplant is, a, is actually two donors. One is an adult donor and the other is the umbilical cord stem cells from a baby, you know, an umbilical cord that a mother has donated when she gave birth. And what happens is they give you both things. I did not have a match and this is why it works because Baby cord blood is so much more adaptable than any other kind of blood, apparently. So they give you the adult donor first, and then the next day they give you the cord blood from the baby, the stem cell from the baby. And while that, the little baby cord blood migrates to your narrow, marrow, you can correct me, of course, because you're a doctor, but my understanding is it, it migrates to your marrow. And while it multiplies because there's very little of it while it multiplies the adult donor takes care of you and when there's enough of the baby that's grown in your marrow the adult donor fades away and you i now have the cord blood from a baby all right and, and that you, is really extraordinary you know you know, you keep saying in the book, Delia, that you don't want to know the medical details and you don't want them to tell you too much, but you actually do an amazing job of explaining what's happening medically and scientifically, even though you keep insisting that, you know, you've, you've put your trust in the doctors, you, you're on the train and you don't need to be tracking it. Yes, that is because when I wrote the book, <laughs> I needed to understand it better than I did when I went through it. So while I was writing the book, I had to look up things like what an HLA is or what, you know, things I had to be able to take you on this trip with me. And I had to make it as simple, but clear as it was, because it is a medical miracle. Mm -hmm. um, and medicine is, is doing such amazing things now. I mean, what, I read, I mean, they're, they're doing bone marrow, they're doing stem cell transplants now for um, people of um, sickle cell anemia uh, and um, people of diabetes. I mean, they're doing it for, it's an amazing area of medicine. And I just happened to, but I had to learn it to write it because it's true. I was pretty much of an ignoramus when I was going through it. it one thing I do want to say, I think that when you're a patient, and you're sick, you're the same person you were when you were well in certain ways. And I'm not someone who likes to Google things. I don't, I'm not a journalist. I don't need to assemble every piece of information and make sense of it. I just sort of trust my ability to pick somebody, which I did with Robos. And then, and then I have to advocate because I am so anxious and so panicky temperamentally that uh, I can't handle stuff like that. So my tendency was to leave it to Dr. Robus. And also, you know, I did fall in love with a doctor. So I was in very good shape because Peter knew what I was going through. Um, just to come back to the story of the transplant, you did meet one of the donors or you did meet the adult I donor. Did. Yeah, I, I've not, I've not given the name. I've, they won't give you the name of the baby. So I just know it was a baby boy. <laughs> Um, but they did give me the adult donor, and her name is Casey McLean, and she lives 
in Florida on the Gulf Coast. And she's a complete lovely person. She's 28. She's studying to be a certified health education specialist. And she registered when she was 25 and they called her two years later. And she, and it, it's complicated. You know, I mean, it's not, it isn't painful in any way to be a bone marrow donor, especially now. They, now they can just do it. They just transfuse your blood out of you, take the stem cells and transfuse it back. It's not, it's five hours in the hospital. But there's a lot of preparation. I mean, they flew her twice to Washington. She had to change planes in Atlanta. She had to stay overnight. She had to, you know, she couldn't eat this. She had to eat that. You know, I mean, she gave herself over to this. And she's just charming. Anyway, yeah, I got to write her after two years. I got to write her and we, we've been in communication. It's very exciting, really, to, you know. Well, uh, coming back to writing your way through this or writing about it or being a writer, I was so struck by some of the images that you you use when you're sort of writing about being sick, when you're writing about thinking of yourself. I wondered if you would talk a little bit about the eclipse story, which really made an impression on me. Um, well, I'm, I'm Peter. Peter loves the stars and the moon and everything. And it's not something I ever knew anything about. And you know, falling in love with someone can open you up to things. And there was a solar eclipse, which we all remember a couple of years ago. And he had already booked a place and time. And it, it he figured out we had to go to Oregon because there's a desert there and the likelihood would be there would be no clouds in the sky. Anyway, so we fly there. And so I began to read about this. It's quite an amazing experience, a total eclipse, because you're sitting there. First of all, the moon is really small. Like, like 2,000 square feet or something in diameter, okay? But the sun is 800,000, all right? And for one minute, the moon blocks out the light of the sun. So for me, I was in remission at the time. I really thought of it as the underdog moon taking over the sun. And it was kind of a metaphor for me taking on the mighty leukemia, you know? So, cause I was at that point able to make almost anything about myself. And, <laughs> you know, but we went there and we sat in this field and this ball field and we watched, you know, it, it's unbelievable. The, the, the moon gets in front of the, it moves in front of the sun and you see this little, like a world, the pie wedge suddenly is black. If you wear, you have to wear these glasses, obviously, or you're, you destroy your eyes. But so everybody in the field has these glasses on. Everybody looks like they're in a cult or something. And you're watching this. And this little pie wedge of black just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over an hour. And this colors all drain from the, from the land. I mean, the green, the grass gets almost gray. And then the next thing you know, it's dark for 90 seconds. It is pitch dark in the middle of the morning. And then it starts to lighten again. So I just thought of it as, you know, I mean, it gave me such a feeling that, I mean, this was something that people have experienced for thousands of years before we understood what it was. It must have terrified people, you know, before they understood what that meant, what astronomy or anything. So it, it just connected me in some way, looking, looking when I, I was in, remission and thinking about death a lot. It just connected me to the world in a, in a bigger way. It was fabulous and very powerful. It's a very powerful section. And the whole idea of how during your illness, you talk about it again when you go visit Tintern Abbey and you begin to think about whether you're, you know, identifying yourself with the ruined building and just the, the, the sort of the way your perspective shifts is, you know, really interesting to follow. I mean, I know this is a book in which, the, you know, there are amazing portraits of amazing doctors and they're written about with love and with gratitude, but you also get 
Um, and I think maybe you should read us the section um, about a doctor who you didn't find quite so amazing. Yes. Because again, it, it conveys the voice and it conveys um, the, the sense of the narrative so well. I would be delighted to do that. Um, just before I was going to have this bone marrow transplant, I was told that I couldn't have it unless they got rid of all the leukemia in my marrow first. And so they put me back on CPX351 and they gave me, I mean, there's a lot of chemo that goes with getting a, a stem cell transplant, but this was before that they decided to put me in this trial. On the first day, the oncologist making rounds stops in. I'll call this person Dr. C. That's not the doctor's initial. Dr. C sits down in my room and says, unasked, you might be immune to CPX. Immune? I had no idea I could develop immunity to my life-saving drug. If I'm immune, I'm screwed. Instantly, my fragile hopes plummet. Instantly, I am furious. Instantly, I hate this doctor. Yes, hate. I am for sure full of rage right now, although giving the impression, I believe, of being merely anxious. But looking at the end game, going to endless tests, trying to trust bleak odds, talking and thinking about the mess of me every single second. Of course, I'm also angry, scared too, and looking for someone to dump it all on. When Dr. C tells me it could be all over soon, that I could be immune, this doctor is it. I've found my target. I'm sure you know this because you're a doctor, but that is called casting crepe. And doctors should never do it. It's, it's for casting a negative possible outcome to a patient. I began to believe from that having people believe that it, that it could work. I mean, I, I was given... You know, I was first given 20% odds that my bone, my stem cell transplant would work. And Dr. Robo called me up and she said, you are not a statistic. And she took me through all the things in my body that made me quite not a statistic, like my beautiful liver and heart and everything like that. And, you know, and then she said, don't be scared of the treatment. Be scared of leukemia. And, and, you know, that is how you talk to a patient, you know, but walking in when I am now, I've put my life on the line and I'm trying this and I am told it could be all over. I mean, that is a cruel thing to do. And it is projecting a negative outcome to a patient. And, and I think it's, I think believing is important, really important. So coming back to Dr. Robos and another moment when she finds exactly the right thing to say, I want you to talk for a, a minute about a, a moment in the book when you're at a really low point in terms of your motivation, um, mm -hmm. in terms of your belief, in terms of how you're feeling. And she comes to see you and says, give me 48 hours. And if I get somewhere, give me another 48. And it's a, a very important moment. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, well, a bone, a bone marrow stem cell transplant is, is pretty brutal. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of chemo, not just the CPX, but then, you know, before you have it, there's, there's this awful drug called melphalan that, and very quickly you are, throwing up all the time and also you can't keep anything down and there's nothing has any taste and you i was taking a, i feel like it was a million pills a day it was probably just 30 but every five minutes a nurse would come in and try to give me a pill and i couldn't keep them down and i got thinner and thinner and sicker and sicker and i began to get i mean and so eventually i was ultimately in the hospital I, I left for a short time, but then I went back in. I was in the hospital about 100 days. And in about the last two weeks of those 100 days, I really wanted to die. I was begging everyone to let me go. 
and I was so I I I wrote my internist. She came to the hospital. I said, "Please kill me." She wouldn't. You know, I I, I said, you know, please put me on some drug. You know, I I told John who'd been through this with me, John Lapook from the beginning, I said, and he said, you're depressed, you know, you, you know, your numbers, your numbers, statistically, my numbers were good, but I was so sick and so depressed. I mean, I had graft versus host disease, so my stomach was, uh, I had something wrong with my stomach, and then I started to um, need oxygen, all right? So I, and Peter wouldn't, I couldn't get anywhere with Peter. You know, he was going to believe, he believed that I could get well. So I wrote Dr. Robos and he a text and I said, you know, please let me go. And, and I, you know, depression, I don't know if you've ever really been horribly depressed because it wasn't something I'd ever experienced before, but you just don't see anything. All you want is blackness. All you want is a way out. You, you lose love for everything in your life. You just do. And you can't really be allowed to make any decisions in that state, for sure. But Dr. Robos came in her adorable way. I mean, she's always dressed really well, and she's kind of glamorous, and this really looks wonderful. And she said, what's going on, you know? And I said, please let me go, you know? Just put me on something like morphine. And she said, give me 48 hours. And if I get somewhere, give me another 48. You know, it's hope and an end game in one sense. And of course, somewhere in me, I really did want to survive. So the 48 hours, but at the same time, she was giving me a, a finite period of time, you know, and I, I said to her, because I, I know a lot of doctors, I hope doctors and nurses will, will watch this, but I, I told her later, you know, that was so brilliant that you just gave me this, you know, hope in an endgame and a finite period of time, you know. And she said, small bites. Small bites. So it's obviously something she learned in medical school. That when a patient is that around the bend, you can't give them a big picture. You have to just give them a small bite. And that's what she gave me. And it, I thought, yes, fine. It was just, and, and the next thing I knew, I woke up and it must have been 48 hours. I was off my oxygen. There was Peter sitting across the room. And, you know, when I was depressed, I didn't even think I was in love anymore. I mean, I didn't think, and then suddenly there he was and he just looked handsome as ever. I was so happy to see him and it was an amazing moment, but it was, it was as dark as my life has ever been. So the last thing I want to ask you then comes at the happy ending of your book, which happens in February of 2020. And when you were actually, you know, which we all know is the beginning of something else, is a beginning of a, a medically and socially complicated period for us all. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about writing this book um, in the time of COVID. You know, when I was reading the book, I was struck by the way you say, and they tell me I have to wear a mask. Um, you know, all of these these things which are new in your life when you get sick, wear a mask, you know, worry about, about being exposed, worry about it, whether it's safe to take the subway. And then, of course, when you were actually writing the book, we were all living through the pandemic. And I wondered if you wanted to, to comment at all on, on what happens after the book's ending. It was extremely ironic, wasn't it? I mean, I went into his office. It was two years after my, and he said, you know, you're not going to get this. He said, any more than I'm going to get it. And I've never had it. And and we left. And I, it's so hard to believe. And I think I'm trying. I, I hadn't started writing. In fact, I was thinking I would never write again. And I still didn't have my writer's heart beating. And um you know, we, we left and then the next thing we knew, 
it was COVID and I couldn't go anywhere or do anything. But part of the worst thing about COVID was that if you were old, which I was over 70, um, you were targeted. You were the old people. You were the ones who were going to die if you got it. You know, and I had just survived, you know, so I, it was it was as if I was thrust into a whole nother world. And, and really being on the street was was a terrifying experience because because if you were old, that's who was going to die. They just isolated us. And until. So. You know, Peter would, would was like a guard dog. We'd walk down the street and he'd see someone coming at us and have a mask. He'd like yank me across to the other side of the street. You know, it got very, it was really scary, but it was a different kind of scary because we were all in it together. And, um, and then Peter and I just decided it was too difficult right then to be in New York. So we, you know, well, first of all, it got to be summer and my, and I started to think, I have a story to tell. I knew I had just a fantastically big story to tell of hope. Because that's what the story is. It's about love and hope. And um, and a friend of mine, uh, a younger, talented person, did this, me this giant favor of assembling everything in my computer for those three years of my life. Well, actually starting with... 19, 2015 when when Jerry died to 2020 and all my emails all the notes in my computer everything and she gave me six giant loose leaf binders in order and I started to write that summer so if I'm writing I'm usually pretty I can be alone you know I'm not writers writers don't need to be that I'm not that gregarious um so I could be alone with my writing and I was pretty happy. And then we went out to California, we, we bought a van and we drove a car, cause there was nothing more terrifying than a public bathroom. So we bought a van with a bathroom or sort of. And um, we drove across country and we ended up in my brother-in-law's house in LA. And with him, we just hung out. And during that time I wrote the book and I was actually pretty happy. I was ecstatic when we got them, when we got vaccinated. I mean, that was really wonderful. Um, but um, the book really gave me, in addition to getting me to the other side of the trauma, it, it really gave me something to do every day. I sent for my hospital records. I had 6,000 pages of hospital records, which seemed quite a lot. And I never got through them all. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, if you're a writer, you can be alone better than many other people. Delia, is there anything that I should have asked you and haven't asked you and that you wanted to say? No, I mean, I just know that, you know, I really think that, that this book is about medicine, love and friendship and the power of them working together and that's why I'm here. So the book is Left on 10th by Delia Efron. It's wonderful. And i um, really, really grateful to you for coming to talk about it with us tonight. Um, and um, I would just want to say for the Bellevue Literary Review, you can check us out at blreview.org that we're honored to have hosted you and honored to have been part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Perry. It was just great. Have fun.